returning to our uh, study part two of the um, solar calendar and its main face uh, by Victor Hodoff and um, with an emphasis on the ceremonial Pentecost which did not um, come to light with great significance until um, the end of ben Benjamin Roden's uh, ministry 1978 through uh, um, about 1985 through Lois Roden's um, ministry where she gave us the truth of the ceremonial Pentecost in the work of the Holy Spirit in the work of sanctification on the wave sheaf candidates, the baptism by, baptism by fire, uh, the transformation of our characters through the daily ministration, her daily ministration at this time. Uh, and she does speak of that in another letter. Uh, I won't try to bring that out right now. Uh, but she said we are to be, uh, just as Ellen White did, preparing for a time when we are to stand without an, an intercessor. Not without any intercessor, but without an intercessor. And the, ba the big emphasis in Lois Roden's ministry was that we had two intercessors, one in heaven and one in the earth, uh, for the last 2,000 years. And um, that message began to come out in 1844, but was not uh, truly brought out until um, um, 1978. Um, at the transition point between Ben Roden's ministry and Lois Roden's uh, ministry. Uh, I would like to go to a particular scripture uh, before I conclude my um, comments on the ceremonial Pentecost and get more directly into the calendar. Um, Isaiah 32 was a chapter that Lois Roden um, spoke about, in particular to ceremonial Pentecost. I'll, I'll read through it. I'll only comment on just um, maybe a couple of verses. But it's very, very significant for our time because it starts off here in verse 1, Isaiah 32, 1, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. And a man shall be as a hiding place from the wind, and a covert from the tempest, as rivers of water in a dry place, as the shadow of a great rock in a weary land. And the eyes of them that see shall not be dim, and the ears of them that hear shall hearken. That's us today. Uh, verse 4, the heart also of the rash shall understand knowledge, and the tongue of the stamina, stam, stam, excuse me, stammerers shall be ready to speak plainly. The vile person shall be no more called liberal, nor the churl said to be bountiful. Uh, that's King James English, a little bit difficult to understand. Verse um, 6, for the vile person sh will speak villainy, and his heart will work in equity to practice hypocrisy and to utter error against the Lord, to make empty the soul of the hungry, and he will cause the drink of the thirsty to fail. I believe that's a reference to the daily and the misapplication of it. Verse 7, the instruments also of the churl are evil, and he devises wicked devices to destroy the poor with lying words. Uh, I would say that's the poor in spirit that Lois Roden talked about. She always used that phrase, um, blessed are the poor in spirit, from the uh, Beatitudes. Those that think less of themselves, those that do not promote themselves to the highest office. Uh, that's the context that she was speaking of in her time, the poor in spirit. Even when the needy speaketh right, verse eight. But the liberal deviseth liberal things, and the liberal things shall be shall and by liberal things shall he stand. Verse nine. Rise up, ye women, that are at ease. Hear my voice. 
you careless daughters, give ear unto my speech. Uh, many days and years shall you be troubled, you careless women, for the, vin the vintage shall fail, the gathering shall not come. Tremble, ye women that are at ease, be troubled, ye careless ones, strip you, make you bare, and gird sackcloth upon your uh, loins. That's indicating um, true repentance there, or calling for it. Verse 12, they shall lament for the, for the teats, for the pleasant fields, for the fruitful vine. Verse 13, upon the land of my people shall come up thorns and briars, yea, upon all the houses of joy in the joyous city. Verse 14, because the palaces shall be forsaken, the multitude of the city shall be left, the forts and towers shall be for dens forever, a joy of wild asses, a pasture of flocks. Now this is the important verse. The Lois Roden quoted this many times. Until the Spirit be poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field, and the fruitful field be counted for a forest. And, you know, trees represent leaders, so that would be reference, referencing a forest there. But saying here, until the Spirit be poured out upon us from on high, and the wilderness be a fruitful field. And this is talking about a reference to the kingdom in the wilderness. Fruitful field actually is the definition of the name Carmel. And um, this is where this teaching originated, New Mount Carmel. It's, it is a fruitful field. It has been a fruitful field for truth. But there's also been great apostasy there. And still is. But it says here that there's going to be a change. The fruitful field be counted for a forest. Verse 16, then judgment shall dwell in the wilderness. That's the judgment of the living. And righteousness remain in the fruitful field. In uh, New Mount Carmel and, more, and in the branch movement and message. Verse 17, and the work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation and in sure dwellings and in quiet resting places. When it shall hail, that hail represents judgment, coming down on the forest, and that's, I would say, that's the branch forest, and the city shall be low in a low place. Um, the forest could also represent the whole Advent movement, three phases of it. Verse uh, 20, last verse, Blessed are ye that sow beside all waters that send forth thither the feet of the oxen and the ass. So this is what Lois Roden was teaching. The expectation of the baptism of fire, spirit poured out from on high in the wilderness, and that we, or the Wave Sheep Company, were not going to have to wait until the antitypical day of Pentecost that Sister White speaks of in um, Volume 9, page 126. The, um, the Great Revival and Reformation, first in truth and in power. Um, there are Adventists praying worldwide, round the clock, uh, for the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. This is what is promoted on 3ABN. And that's great. That's wonderful. But they don't understand that the truth comes first, or rather the, the Holy Spirit comes first in truth, then in power. And that truth portion is all seven messages of Revelation 14. Not just three angels, but all seven. Uh, six of them are represented in Revelation 14 alone. But this chapter starts out, Behold, a king shall reign in righteousness, and princes shall rule in judgment. This is very contextual with what Lois Roden taught. The context of the um, reigning royal power that Ellen White talked about in 1901, to let the Holy Spirit be king. Uh, April 1st, 1901. I believe it was Review and Herald or General Conference Special. I forgot which one. 
So she, um, the uh, parallel chapter to this, I believe, is uh, Isaiah 40, which says, Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. Speak you comfortably to Jerusalem. Uh, Jerusalem is our mother, according to um, Galatians uh, 4. Uh, Jerusalem above, and there's a Jerusalem in the earth as well. Uh, represent a city represented by a person, a divine person, and cry unto her that her warfare is her warfare is accomplished, that her inequity is pardoned, for she hath received of the Lord's hand double for all her sins. This is representing the city of Jerusalem, and a typical Jerusalem, the people, the movement, the church, but all of that is represented by a divine person who is representing us as priest and king. Um, the voice of him that cries in the wilderness, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley shall be exalted and every mountain sh and hill shall be made low. And the crooked shall be made straight and the rough places plain. This is how, this is what judgment does. Judgment makes uh, the crooked places straight and the rough places plain. And uh, the illusion illu here of uh, verse 4 is that uh, there's going to be an exaltation and a humbling being made low, depending on who is actually humbling themselves in the movement in the message uh, by what they're saying and who is exalting the crown of authority in the church for today be it a man or the Holy Spirit Holy Ghost verse 4 or verse 5 and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it. I'm saying shall see her together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken it. The voice said, Cry. And he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all the good, goodliness thereof is as the flower of the field. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, but the Spirit of the Lord, of yod heh bloweth upon it. Surely the people is grass. Um, I won't read all this chapter. Um, I'll, I'll go through this um, in a different study. I do have a written study on the website, uh, Isaiah 40. I forgot the title of it. But it says that um, it's reflecting the uh, Nahum, I think Nahum 1 message. In verse 9, O Zion that bringeth good tidings, get thee up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem that bringeth good tidings, lift up thy voice with strength. Lift, up, lift it up and be not afraid. Say unto the cities of Judah, Behold your God. The cities of Judah representing the advanced messages of the Advent movement. Um, SDA representing the ten tribes of the north and Judah the two tribes of the south, uh, Davidian and Branch, and the message is saying, Behold your God. You know, why do we behold our God? Because uh, the Holy Spirit is King. And um, verse 10 says, Behold, the Lord God will come with a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. Um, there's almost too much here to uh, to comment on right now. I want to get back to the calendar, but his arm uh, is also referenced in Isaiah 63. Um, he looked and saw no man, so it says his own arm um, helped him. I forgot the exact phrase. Since I'm right here in Isaiah, I'll go to it real quick. Um,
it's found in Isaiah 63 uh, verse 5 and I looked and there was none to help and I wondered that there was none to uphold therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury it upheld me it's a very uh, prophetic statement pointing to someone connected to Christ his arm I would say his right arm and um, the one who is going to bring salvation or complete salvation through the uh, ministration of uh, sanctification which is the office and the sealing and the, uh, that's the office of the Holy Spirit Divine Mother or Divine Daughter um, both of them actually one in heaven and one in earth So this is a, an overview of what the meaning of Ceremony of Pentecost represents. It's a composite message, um, the baptism of fire that we expect 50 days after the Feast of Tabernacles. And um, it bears uh, considerable study um, during those 50 days every year, year by year. And by understanding that, this um, its meaning and the work of the Holy Spirit we become sanctified we become transformed through the daily through the impartation of the glory I would like to go to uh, back to the Shepherd's Rod publications to answer book three Here in answer book three, um, beginning page nine, where he starts the section, when does the Hebrew year begin? Uh, he has makes some general comments here on uh, the feasts. And uh, a little bit about their significance. On page 10, On page 10, he gets into the uh, particulars of how the calendar operates and um, he says here, um, thus we see that his great and never erring timepiece for earth, the earth's own invariable movements, fix the day and the year whereas the moons revolving around the earth makes the months he actually says um, uh, something different on the chart that the um, the civil months become inconsequential as I'll show here in a minute um, but the Roman New Year January 1 finds its establishment not in the movements of the solar system but in the no notions of mythology Consequently, as the dates, as the date does not conclude with either the vernal or the autumnal equinox, or with either the summer or the winter solstice, then should Earth's inhabitants, then should Earth's inhabitants ever lose count of the day, and need to recover it, they would be helpless to do so. To prevent his people from bringing upon themselves such a catastrophe, and to have them intelligent as to the time the year begins, the Lord gave to Moses the sacred yearly calendar which cannot be lost or miscalculated. So long as the earth remains, he told them, or he told him, Moses, that the day which preceded the Exodus was the fourteenth day of the first month, and that forever thereafter they were to comm commemorate the Passover on the very night each year the night following the fourteenth day, thus the Lord's reestablishing the creation calendar, reaffirming that the year begins on the day of the vernal equinox, on which spring, the first season of the year, commences, and on which the sun and the moon were created, fourth day of the beginning of creation. The only point in time 
which, in the very nature of things, the year could begin. And so it is that the Passover, the Atonement and the Feast of Tabernacles, the three most important feasts of the year, besides other feasts, are controlled by the solar year and the lunar month, the weekly Sabbath by the day on which the creation began, and the year itself by the uh, vernal equinox, uh, the immovable signpost. Um, many of Brother Hadoff wrote a whole three-part study series in um, Symbolic Code uh, 13, which I, qu I quote in my study, the Genesis clock, showing that, um, I'll read it here, where he states that um, he's speaking, he's addressing uh, the issue of the um, lunar weekly Sabbath in his day, which is still prevalent in our day. But he can't comment on that without commenting on the related topic of the yearly feasts uh, as well. Be, uh, and take note that the, um, the Jewish people and the Hebrews of old never kept a lunar weekly Sabbath. Uh, the moon was never intended to mark uh, the count of days of the week, only the count of days um, of the month that they presume to do, that Brother Hadif note notes here in his um, statement in uh, 13 code, let's see, it's 13 symbolic code number 9 and 10, but he specifically states here in this paragraph, Bible commentator, commentators generally hold that sometime after the Hebrews went out of Egypt, they began to use lunar time. Now, mind you, they never lost track of the weekly cycle because the weekly and yearly cycles were always separate from creation week. The sun and the moon were not created until day four. The weekly cycle came about first day of, week of the creation week. So they, they were disconnected from the beginning. But something more happened because the moon is not doing what Genesis 1, 16, and 17 say it's supposed to do. The moon is supposed to rule only the night. Just like it says in, that the sun was 16 and seven, Genesis 1, 16, and 17, that the sun was to rule the day only, and the moon was to rule the night only. But we look today and we see the moon all throughout the day through most of the month, at least half of the month. We see the moon um, visible during the day. And there is a reason for that, because uh, uh, sin entered. And that's a whole different topic. But um, the Jews themselves never observed a, a lunar weekly Sabbath. But they did incorporate the lunar um, observance with the monthly yearly calendar. But you'll find there's not one word in Scripture to indicate that the moon was to denote uh, the days of the week, the count, the seven-day count of the week, or even the monthly count of days. And that's important to remember. There's a verse in Psalms that says the moon is a faithful witness to determine the seasons or the Moedim. And the seasons come about seasonally, not monthly, but seasonally, three months to a season. Three times four is twelve. So we have four seasons that the moon is to um, uh, denote in the origin, in the original, on the original calendar in Genesis one, when it rose exactly opposite of the sun when it's when the sun set every e evening the moon rose up in the east and the moon had a light of its own it didn't have phases as we see today Can, cannot be proven by Genesis 1 that it had phases the word as I point out here in this study um, the um, 
the moon was to rule only the night and the word for light in Genesis 1, 16 and 17 the very word is the same for both the sun and the moon in the Hebrew. I don't know if I can, yeah it says here um, and God made two great lights the greater light to rule the, the day and the lesser light to rule the night he made the stars also. Um, both the lights are referenced in Strong's number in Strong's Concordance 3974. Um, the greater light and the lesser light. <coughs> so continuing on here with Victor Hodup's comments he says Bible commentators generally hold that sometime after the Hebrews went out of Egypt they began to use lunar time, but no one knows exactly when. When and by whom it was commanded. Suppose it is true that the Jews kept lunar time, and they have. The rabbinic calendar of today is both solar and lunar. They do recognize the um, vernal equinox as a starting point of the year, but they don't observe it as Brother Hadaf clearly shows on his chart which is under direct inspiration and makes total sense because they use the new moon cycle or the monthly lunar cycle and the new moon um, conjunction either before or after the equinox whichever is closest so they don't fall directly on the um, start of the year as Brother Hadaf indicates in um, answer book 3 uh, page 11 but he says here suppose it is true that the Jews kept lunar time it is no sign that we should follow their unbiblical example for their constant insubordination caused them to do many things which they had no business doing and Brother Hadaf applies this not only to the um, the apostasy of the um, lunar Sabbath theory, but also the use of the the, uh, the moon in the the yearly cycle as well. Uh, the moon has another purpose, which has not been well known uh, since its uh, orbital change, sometime after sin entered. Uh, when the complete restoration comes about, the moon will do exactly what it says in Genesis um, 1 that it will rule the night it didn't say both day and night but only the night and um, so getting back here to the feast chart and I hope my cursor can be uh, more visible uh, after I complete this but the um, as you see here the outer ring here it has the yellow and um, the outer ring represents the as he says here right here solar days or the solar year. This inner ring in part, not completely, but in part represents what he calls lunar months and he represents the current state of the moon with months of varying lengths. Um, reason being that the uh, lunar, and, uh, lunar cycle yearly and the solar cycle yearly do not coincide. The lunar cycle, the lunar yearly cycle, has only um, 354 days in it, 12 lunar cycles, and and a fraction, I believe. Our um, solar yearly cycle has 365 and a quarter days in it. So, right there shows that there's a serious problem involved uh, with orbital mechanics between the Sun and the Moon. In the beginning it wasn't so. But he represents the solar year in this outer ring 
and um, you'll notice carefully that all of the holy days, all the Moedim, all the feast days, are connected directly to this outer ring anywhere you go on it. Now, even as he shows here at the top the baptism of Christ on the 16th day of the seventh month. But you'll notice on this inner ring none of the feast days are represented or pointed to. It's, it's, this is so carefully, this, calendar, this, this um, chart is so carefully drawn and it's not only brilliant, it's, it's inspired. But he shows how the solar month, the solar year controls the feast, but our present lunar months don't control anything in this inner ring. But he represents them here as a reference point to our um, civil year and our commonly understood year and the lunar cycle. Um, it can't be a reliable cycle, the lunar, because it has days of varying, uh, varying number of days per month throughout the year. You'll notice that he begins the feasts in the spring here at the vernal equinox at the bottom of the chart. The first month goes directly down to this uh, call out box, the Brutal Equinox, March 20, on or about March 20th. It varies slightly every few years, which is normal and uh, acceptable because it, it is evidencing the um, the uh, actual cycles and movements of the uh, sun. Um, all of the key dates of the feast days, such as the um, crucifixion on the 18th day, or rather the resurrection on the 18th day of the first month is called out here in direct connection to the solar ring. But you'll notice here there is no resurrection in the, in the uh, types of the feasts or the sacrificial system on anywhere near the 30th day of, a, of the month as it shows here in the corresponding lunar ring. And um, it's is showing in a in a very um, uh, clever way the relationship between our current calendar and the sacred calendar, which is solar in nature. In fact, he actually he actually says that uh, I quote it in uh, thirteen code in my study that he says that the uh, the sacred calendar is not lunar but solar quote unquote. I'll see if I can find it here real quick. Here's one reference he makes in the 13th Symbolic Code, uh, apparently at the end of it. He says, if any one of the two lumin luminary planets, he calls them planets, <laughs> should be honored to govern the Holy Sabbath, it should be the sun, the one which rules not only the moon, but also the entire system. And he's uh, Had God instead intended the moon to be the regulator and indicator, the system would have been entitled lunar instead of solar. And that's in relation to the uh, weekly cycle. But here in this earlier statement, he states, let's see where I'll start here. Uh, he's talking about the yearly calendar in relation to Moses, or rather uh, Noah and the flood, which was given, uh, as he says here, 12 nominal months of 30 days each uh, would gave 360 days. Missing five days were added on at the end of the end, uh, assume, presumably the end of the year, under the name of days additional to the year. But he says here, um, Here at the bottom of the page, uh, he says, Still further, the calendar which the prophets used in both the Old and New Testaments was not lunar, but solar. For example, in Noah's time, 150 days were equal to five months, 30 days for to a month. Genesis 7, uh, 11. In Daniel 7, 25, 12, 7, also Revelation 12, 14, times and 
and uh, the dividing of time, three and a half years, um, are interpreted in Revelation 12.6 and 13.5 to be 1260 days or 42 months, 30 days to a month. And his key statement here is heaven's way of measuring time is therefore not lunar but solar. Um, he quotes here in Genesis 1.14, when God created the moon, he appointed it to rule the night, not the day. He's very specific about that. And we can see that for ourselves when the moon rises or we see it in the afternoon or in the morning or during the middle of the day even. He says, not the moon alone, therefore, but both the sun and the moon jointly appointed, he appointed for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, that brings up the question, going back to Brother Hadif's calendar here, how does the moon rule this? Well, originally it did, without question. And I have to go to my um, program here to kind of give a little idea how it works. I can't show it exactly because I can't manipulate the um, sky image to the point where I can make the moon do whatever it want, what I want it to do, or what it obviously was doing in Genesis 1 um, before sin entered and probably a little while afterwards as well. But I can, um, here on this image, on this program, I'm facing due east. We know the sun rises, the sun and the moon rise in the east every day, every night. And um, this green line in the image, of course it's showing the um, the 12 major constellations, 12 or 13 major constellations uh, with the blue lines, they're little outlines. Uh, there are 88 constellations total but only 12 major con constellations which um, appear or divide the uh, line of the ecliptic. The ecliptic is this green line, I'm, so I've added the line or the program adds the line if you want it <coughs> to show the path of the sun and the planets throughout the year. Even though the earth wobbles on its axis, this program shows that as well. I'm going to speed it up. Um, this is what the intro image was showing. The um, uh, rotation or the cycle of the constellations, the 12 major constellations, along the ecliptic line, um, day by day which looks um, looks like this. Hold on a second here. It's going slow now. This is 300 times faster than we normally see day by day. But if I speed this up to 3,000 times, then you can see what the sun is doing every day when it uh, following this uh, green line in the ecliptic. Uh, coming into nightfall again. And um, But if I speed this up, I'm facing east. As the Earth rotates into the eastern sky, um, as it were, or seems to be, or it actually does, we see these different constellations. And the Sun remains I'll wait till the sun comes up here again. The sun remains in one particular constellation per month. And it's important to note, so does the moon, or at least it did originally. It doesn't today. Um, actually, it does today, but um, because it's visible during the day, it's still not doing its job. Um, so the sun, I'll get rid of the daylight here, even though it's morning. And we'll see that the sun in this particular example is in the constellation of uh, Scorpius. And it remains there for one month. Um, and originally so did the moon when it came up at night, at the 180 degrees from this location when the moon uh, was setting 
as the sun is rising in the east, the uh, moon is setting in the west day by day. So it rules the night. But if I um, speed this up to a one year period, condensed into one minute, you can see what what the Sun is doing throughout the year. It's going through each constellation month by month, 12 constellations. Well, that's exactly what the Moon does or did also. It still does, but not according to its original plan. And it's that indication at night using the Moon as a pointer, the lesser light, you could see, you could actually see what constellation the Moon was in every night. The Sun, you can't do that, but we know the Sun is exactly 180 degrees um, originally from the Moon, so we also would know what constellation the Sun was in, just by calculation or um, simulation. But this is exactly what the Moon did originally. It was a pointer of the seasons of the year. Each constellation represents a different season. The constellation of um, Aries should be coming up here shortly. There's Leo the Lion, Cancer the Summer, Gemini, Taurus the Bull, Aries. There it is, right there. I'll back it up just a little bit. Yeah, there's Aries. Um, when the moon was seen in this constellation every year, um, end of March, our present day March, April, we knew it was time for Passover. But because of the um, uh, the reason that this happens the way it does, that both the Sun and the Moon are seen in different constellation months, month by month, which is kind of common knowledge in uh, as astronomy circles and, it, and especially in astrology, which we don't use, is that um, uh, as you'll see here, going forward, let's see, that the constellations are now setting in the east. Now you can see the, the moon is popping up here and there because it's uh, uh, revolving around the earth in a at extreme speed at this uh, simulation speed. And so you see um, these constellations are running backwards to the sunrise and sunset circle because this is, this is one year compressed into one, one minute basically. So um, that's called the precession of the constellations and that's what makes uh, or shows the seasons of the year as they're um, that the Sun and the Moon can be seen in different constellations month by month. So anyway, that's that should be uh, easy to understand once you see it visualized and you look at it uh, carefully. But the main point here to understand is that uh, this cycle of uh, the feasts is tied strictly to the solar. Brother Hadif expressly states that in the 13 uh, symbolic code and uh, you can read it for yourself and um, he shows that the uh, the lunar cycle in its actual and practical application here doesn't control the feast at all it's visually right here in front of you you can look at the very rough representation of the days of the uh, lunar calendar month um, but they don't correspond to the solar cycle, the outer ring here. And as at the bottom here, he shows the end of the sacred year, 360 days, and then add the five days for 365. And he says right there is where the vernal equinox begins. Um, not at the uh, any representation of the lunar month that happens to be close to that is only coincidental. You'll see that it fall, the lunar months fall out of synchronization with the feasts and the um, 
the outer circle very rapidly as this pr circle progresses through the year. But here's the first month, spring, which begins the countdown to um, Passover every year, always connected to the outer ring, the solar cycle. Uh, I may add more to this um, in uh, subsequent videos, and um, I'll, I'll uh, conclude there, and uh, thank you for your attention, and um, study these things to see if they're so. Prove all things, hold fast that which is good.